Hi, everyone. Steve Adubato. This is Lessons in Leadership. I'm with my colleague, Mary Gamba. We kick off the program with our longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Andy Anderson, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Quality Officer, RWJ Barnabas Health. Barnabas Health. RWJ Barnabas Health, a longtime supporter of public broadcasting. And uh, Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Andy, let's jump right into this. You and I have had a lot of offline conversations about physician leadership, physician communication. I do coaching. Uh, to disclose, I do some coaching with some physician leaders at RWJ Barnabas Health. Why is it so important that a clinician, trained researcher, clinician, surgeon, is a very competent, effective communicator? Talk about that, doctor. Well, our, our healthcare system desires the very best outcomes um, for patients and, and for communities. And a, and a physician leader is at the table and often is leading um, to drive to those outcomes. And, and part of being an effective leader and a physician leader as well is to be an influencer and to, to influence there needs to be communication that is that is clear that that makes sense that can you know hopefully inspire people to to really step into the work and and deliver those very best outcomes. Doctor, before Mary jumps in, this is the thing I, I've often thought about as as I'm working with uh, certain clinicians, you know, across the country in terms of public communication. I often wonder in medical school in the training in the uh, process of becoming a physician and being around physicians so much, how challenging is is it for many physicians to begin to translate all that clinical, medical knowledge, jargon, language to the rest of us who don't understand? Yeah, I think it is challenging, and there is some element of training that that does occur in medical school and residency and, and then along the way i like to think of it as as if i'm talking to my father or grandfather how would i explain something and, and so you know as a physician you know at the bedside and and that mindset i think is important to say hey this is my family member how do i explain this to them in a way that they'll understand it um often i think what you're alluding to is there's there's medical jargon there's there's a way that that people learn along the way through their training from other doctors, and some of that gets passed down and in the wrong way. And it really should be um, more of a a conversation using normal words and and just explaining things and making sure that that you're listening as well to understand if if the patient understands what you're explaining to them. And and that's an important part of, of two way communication as well is to to have the patient sort of repeat back in what you said and or just make sure there's no questions that aren't um, unanswered. Well said, Mary. Yeah, let's talk about empathy and leadership a little bit, especially with physician leaders and that ability to empathize. And so many physicians, they've seen it before. If they're giving a diagnosis, a horrible diagnosis, that's hard to hear. What advice do you have for physicians, but for any leader watching today, when it comes to truly empathizing and putting yourself in someone else's shoes as a leader? Yeah, I think that's not necessarily um, natural to everyone, and you know, some people it is, and and then they're in the right profession because you know part of what healthcare is centered on is is being empathetic um, at the bedside with the individual you know patient in front of you. But just generally, the field of healthcare is it requires quite a bit of empathy. My my advice is to to practice um, before um, you know seeing a patient. It can be brief. It could be five or ten seconds to practice in your head how you might respond, um, what words you might choose to to say, and then on the other side of that, you know, getting feedback along the way is is very important. We're starting to do um, that in our health system. We're starting to coach our our physicians, and we've got a team of um, sort of train the trainer type approach that are are pretty good at it. And they're watching our doctors at the bedside and they're giving them feedback outside of the room about things they did well, things they could improve. So getting feedback, getting coaching along the way, I think, um, you know, 95, if not a hundred percent of people need that, no one's perfect. And, and that's, that's part of how we get better at it. Yeah. Mary often uses the word uh, being intentional. Dr. Anderson, you're talking about being very intentional and focused when you're going in to talk to a patient and, and that patient's family, knowing exactly what you want to say, why you want to say it, and thinking about if you were on the other end, what would you want? But I want to follow up on, on a different, uh, slightly different issue. 
I, I often think, talk about empathy. How about empathy for physicians, meaning physician well-being, physician wellness, particularly in a so-called post-COVID era. Dr. Anderson, what is your sense of how physicians are doing in terms of taking care of themselves, their own well-being? Yeah, I think there's a, a big need there. Um, there's lots of statistics that show us that there's a lot of burnout uh, with physicians, with with nurses, with with healthcare professionals generally. And, you know, part of what I think is important and what we've spent time focusing on is wellness and, and making sure that people do take time for themselves. Some of it is as simple as making sure you're taking vacations, you know, regularly, making sure that you're doing things that are fun, making sure that you're not um, working too much. Um, you know, that's where you've got your family and friends who should be checkpoints. And you should, as a physician, say, hey, you know, do you think I'm working too much? You know, just, you know, have a, a normal conversation about it to make sure you are getting feedback because you need those, you need that downtime. You need that time Absolutely. for your brain to uh, sort of recover. And then you need to do those basic things like eat, sleep, exercise. You know, th those things are also are very important for, for wellness. And nurses need it as well. Mary, Absolutely. Please. Let's talk a little bit about coaching and mentoring. There are so many younger physician leaders that are in the pipeline. Uh, my niece, uh, Courtney, happens to be one of them. She's a second year med, uh, med student in her rotation right now. And one of the things that Steve and I keep hearing through our coaching um, and development work with physician leaders is just that next generation, how much more they need, how they are learning differently, how they want to be coached they want to receive feedback differently. Have you noticed a change in your tenure as a physician leader in terms of how we need to be coaching, providing feedback to our up and coming physician leaders? In one of the the, the opportunities that I have that I enjoy the most is mentoring and, and coaching. And there are a number of um, Rutgers students who, as part of one of the rotations, will talk to me about career development and what I really enjoy is is the the energy, the enthusiasm, the optimism um, that that they have. So I mean that's a good thing that the the next generation, from my experience, seems quite optimistic. Um, you know, part of what we need to do is to to keep them optimistic, um, to to show them you know all the good things about healthcare and and how it, it truly is a, a healing and, and empathetic right, profession and how much difference it, it makes in people's lives. So I think. Part of the advice I would give for for medical students and, and residents and up and coming physicians is, is to to make sure that you've got good mentors um, and you need mentors that are optimistic um, and you know those who are able to to coach you can be big influencers in, in terms of decisions that you make about career choice and work life balance and and get just tips about things that you can do to to help keep yourself well. I think it's really important to have those mentors and and informal and formal coaches along the way. Dr. Anderson, last question from, from my perspective is this. Mary talked about her niece, Courtney, you know, becoming a physician, going through residency. But but there's so much research, and anecdotally, we hear it all the time, that there aren't, there aren't enough primary care physicians. How concerned are you about the future of medicine and healthcare when it seems, particularly post-COVID, I know I keep referring to it that way, that the the word out there is it's harder to get physician people to want to be physicians. Do you buy that? The the desire to go to med school is still quite high. It's hard to get in, and it's quite hard to you know um, to have sort of the the credentials to to get into to medical school. So I, I I think you know there's quite a bit of demand out there. I don't I don't think that that's the issue. There there is a bit of a a challenge with having enough residency spots and, and making sure there are going to be enough, you know, of the different types of doctors that are needed in the future. Part of the answer is, is it's a team sport and we've become, I think, better at understanding the role of, of others in healthcare. It's not just about the doctor, it's about the whole team. So building out the the team in a primary care and medical home type model is, is quite important. But Specifically to your question, there's a compensation issue. Our specialists are paid nicely, and, and the primary care doctors are often not. Um, so there, there has been a shift in, in, in compensation. Primary care doctors are being paid more. But I think over time, there's going to have to be even more of a shift as we move more toward value-based care and population health and, and managing patients through a primary care you know, mm -hmm. model. The primary care physician is going to need to be compensated a bit higher to influence people to really want to go into that profession. 
Dr. Andy Anderson is uh, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Quality Officer at RWJ Barnabas Health. I want to thank you, doctor, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve and Mary. Appreciate You've it. You've got it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bicino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, the Helix, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Shoes New Jersey, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and the Meadowlands Chamber and Meadowlands Media. At the Coriel Institute for Medical Research, we choose New Jersey because it's a great place to work and it's a great place to live. We work on understanding disease, but also curing diseases through drug development and clinical trials. This is such a central state and it's such a rich state in resources for medical research that it allows us to do the research that we need to do. This is New Jersey. It all happens here. I am alive today thanks to my kidney donor. I am traveling and more active than ever before. I'm alive today thanks to my heart donor. I'm full of energy and back singing in my church choir. I'm alive today thanks to my lung donor. I'm breathing easy and I'm enjoying life's precious moments. There are about 4,000 people in New Jersey waiting for a life-saving transplant. Donation needs diversity. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit njsharingnetwork.org. Lessons in Leadership would like to thank our newest sponsors who make our programming possible, including The Helix, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And now on Lessons in Leadership, the leadership seminar that you've been waiting for. Now, Mary, t tell folks, what are we talking about, by the way, these seminars, mini seminars? These mini these mini seminars can be found at stand-deliver.com. We're going to put up right our talented editor, Sylvester, just put that up on screen. I'll go like this. If you go to our website, we have a treasure trove of past mini seminars that we've done on everything from conflict resolution to providing feedback to building relationships. So this is just going to be another mini seminar in our library. And if you're watching this and saying, well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't work in an office or I don't think I need these tips and tools. All of these tips and tools can be used in life. They can be used with your children, highly recommend it. They can be used with a spouse, a partner, uh, friends, family. So uh, listen up. You're about to get some great tips and tools on uh, another Stand and Deliver Lessons in Leadership mini seminar. All right. So here it is. This mini seminar Lessons in Leadership mini seminar is called, and you'll see the graphic, Don't Sweat the Q&A. What? What Q&A are we talking about? Look, all of us, whether we're doing this toward the back end of a presidential campaign to be seen later, whoever wins, wins, and then we'll count for four months and see who actually won. So that being said, whether it's a presidential campaign, whether it's a corporate business situation, whether um, it's a student and that student is going, gives a presentation, and then there's a Q&A with the class or the teacher. Uh, regardless of the situation, all of us face questions. How do we deal with tough questions? I've seen people in sports, I'm a big sports fan. I got the, Gi the Giants, as we're doing this game, there's always questions for the coach afterwards. Baseball, Aaron Boone, why did you leave that reliever in when the reliever had nothing? Why didn't you pinch it for so-and-so? So -and -so? Listen, the Yankees will have won the World Series by the time this airs. That being said, Mary, here are the tips and tools when it comes to not sweating the Q&A. Mary, what's up first? Let's go with be patient and listen to the entire question. I don't know about you, Steve, but so often, and I, I think it's a Jersey thing. I, I don't think. I know it's a Jersey thing. We talk fast, and I sometimes say I listen fast, which doesn't really seem to make sense. 
but I'll often complete someone else's sentence in my mind or even worse, I'll finish that sentence and speak out. So what you need to do is be patient. You need to fully listen to what that question is because if not, you may be answering the wrong part of that question by filling in the blanks. And plus it's rude if you just interrupt somebody. You finished because I don't want to interrupt you. You finished? I'm giving you the ball. <laughs> so here's the deal. Let the question. Of course, wait. <laughs> of course, you just well, happen to have a ball there when I handed you that ball. I just have I to give ball. you kudos for that. So, so here's here's the thing. Mary's absolutely right. And and you ever watch a press conference or a Q and A with the Board of Education, whatever it is, and someone's responding? Mary's right. First, it's rude. She's got that. Second of all. Let the questioner feel as if the questioner actually gets the question out instead of you anticipating. It also gives you a chance to think and prepare how you're going to respond. Mary, bullet number two, tip. I just did it. We breathe. Why did I do that? And we teach and coach this in our seminars, that pausing, that breathing, that taking a moment and I'm deliberately slowing down right now, so I probably sound ridiculous on the receiving end, but taking that moment to breathe, it allows you to calm yourself down, bring your blood pressure down just a little bit. I just had that come up. I need to keep my hands down. No, but that's <laughs> I'm not even going to edit that in post because that's Don't hysterical. Edit. That is Zoom. And yeah, so breathing will help you to deal when things go awry and will just help you to calm your thoughts and more importantly, prepare your response. To Mary's point, before we go to the third bullet point or tip or tool and not sweating the Q&A, when you don't breathe, you can first die. But second of all, more likely, you're going to hyperventilate and your brain's not working at that point. Slow down. Mary, bullet number three. You want to be assertive and proactive in your response. And let's take a moment just to talk about the difference between assertive and being how do I say, uh, argumentative. So you want to make sure that you're confident. So we'll use assertive and, you know, okay, just okay. being very strong let's, in your response. Let's show what it actually looks like, Mary. Mm -hmm. There's no place for being aggressive or nasty. There's no place for arguing, and that'll come up in just a second. You don't debate and argue the questioner. Mary, assume for a second I'm the governor of the state, and I said during the campaign I wasn't going to raise taxes. Six months in, I decide to raise taxes. Now there's a press conference. What are you going to ask me? Let's do it right now. I'll show you what I mean. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, you said that you weren't going to raise taxes. What's going on here? Well, first of all, Mary, it's a totally appropriate question. You're not the only one thinking it. And let me say this. During the campaign, I did anticipate that taxes would need to be raised. When I became governor, I realized that the finances in the state were not what they needed to be. We couldn't fund the schools the way they needed to be funded. We couldn't fund environmental programs. The bottom line is this. First, I shouldn't have said in all candor that we weren't going to raise taxes because I didn't know. That was my hope. If I don't do that now and we don't fund our schools and we don't clean the air and water and we don't do the things that are necessary, frankly, I would be uh, remiss in my responsibilities as governor. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. And people can decide for themselves. Now, that th I want to be clear. First of all, you don't avoid the question. You mm -hmm. acknowledge it. Second of all, you're not going to win everyone over. Third of all, don't lie. You did say you weren't going to raise taxes. Now you are. That's just mm -hmm. my view. Bullet four. Well, you just actually uh, demonstrated bullet four, which is flip the script. If somebody asks you a question and you're not quite sure that it's the question that you wanted to be asked, you could turn that question on its head. Sometimes we call it reframing the question. You can flip the script. I asked you a question. You didn't dodge it completely, but you flipped that script and turned it into a question that you would have preferred that I asked. Well said. By the way, when you do watch a political campaign, watch how the candidates never answer a direct question in a debate or a press conference. They just start spinning and reframing without ever acknowledging the question. I'm no fan of that because everybody knows you ducked it. Mary, next bullet. Let's talk about being concise. Too often, people just want to fill that empty space. There's white space, there's noise, there's other things going on in the background. They want to just keep talking, talking, talking. Instead, be concise, and that also helps you to stay on message. To that point. There's an old expression, and it's not just in politics, it's in business, it's in life. If you're explaining, you're losing. Translation. People know when you talk longer and longer, 
it's probably because you're trying to figure out what you need or want to say, and you're making stuff up. Stay tight and concise. In that spirit, Mary, what do I have right now? I here? was just going to say, you just teed that one up. Grab that football. We are Mary, going to talk about staying you, within the goalpost. Now, now, what, now, people don't know this, but in high school and college, uh, people say I didn't play football. I was a place kicker. So people can decide whether that's actually football or not. Um, I had to stay within the goalpost to score a field goal, an extra point. What do we mean stay within the goalpost when it comes to a and a What the heck does it have to do with kicking field goals? There are words, phrases, messages that you want to make sure that you stay. You hear it all the time. Stay on point. Stay on message. That's everything that's inside of those goalposts. Everything that is far outside, not on message, that's going to take you away and potentially put you in that danger zone of saying something that you're going to regret. Those are those things that fall outside of the goalpost, and that's not good. P.S. The longer you're talking, the more likely you are to say things that are outside the goalpost and then say <laughs> afterwards, I was taken out of context. If I had a dollar for every time, you, that out of all the things you've taught me, Steve, being concise in my communication is definitely one of my top five. Yeah, well, I don't always live by that rule. I say it, but I don't always live by it. <laughs> hey, Mary, let's let's be concise. And oh, I said this before. Put it the bullet point. Don't debate the questioner. You don't win arguments. And that does not mean that you have to be a victim to someone asking you a question or be so subservient, but you don't argue, you don't debate. You reframe the question, you reframe, you answer the question to reframe it, but don't argue with people in public. You never win. That's just my opinion. You know, I always tell my leadership seminars, take what you want and leave the rest. The next bullet point, Mary, is anticipate the three or four toughest questions that you're likely to be asked and then practice. Why do we coach people to do that? So many people that we try to coach to do this say, how am I going to know the questions? There's no way to know. If you're going into a meeting to talk about why it's important to walk your dog every day, you can anticipate that people are going to say, well, why is it important to walk your dog every day? What are the benefits of walking your dog every day? What does it matter if I skip a day? There are specific questions that you could be sure that you're going to be asked. And the higher the stakes, the more challenging those questions are going to be. So don't try to pretend like you're not going to be asked those tough questions by asking them yourself and practicing your responses. You'll be much better prepared. And to that point, before we go to the last bullet, I've lost count of the number of corporate executives and others that I've coached who are shocked when a tough question gets asked. Now, ask yourself this. If you're the CEO of a bank or a corporation and your stock price is, and you think at the shareholders meeting, you're not going to get asked, um... Mr. or Ms. CEO, your stock for our stock our stock price has dropped fifty percent in the last year. What are you going to do about it? And why should you still be the CEO? Oh, I can't believe you asked me that question. How do you not think that question is going to be asked? Prepare, think it through, and don't act shocked when you get asked those questions. The last bullet, Mary, is don't be afraid to say I don't know. And I can't tell you how much respect I have for someone, whether they're a public speaker, whether it's a friend, my spouse, when they say, I don't know, I'm like, I get you, we're human. It's too often you just try to, again, fill in the blanks and because, well, I have to have an answer. You asked me a question and especially in a media interview, that's when you're really going to get into a sticky situation. You know, we said that was going to be last, but I'm going to add a caveat. One is I don't know. And the next thing, Sylvester put this last, last bullet, it was this. It is this. I was wrong. What? I said it before about the taxes. I'm not going to get political, but I'll say this. I do wonder when our president, as we do this program, President Biden, when he's asked about the Afghanistan withdrawal, and this isn't political. Why can't he just say it went wrong? I miscalculated. I didn't think it was going to play out that way. And I am responsible. It's true. It's not debatable. And it's not political. Point being, when leaders refuse to say or are incapable of saying I was wrong, everybody knows it was wrong. Why not just say it? That's it. I, That's- I, we can, I know we have a few minutes left and we're talking about going in another direction, but I do have one PS to that because I have a feeling a lot of people watching are going to be asking the question, if Biden or fill in the blanks, whomever, admit oh, go, that go, they go are. Aaron, go, oh, I, we talked about go with Boone. Go with Aaron Boone, the manager of the Yankees. Again, Right. uh, Scarlett and I were talking about this because he's a big Met fan and they're not going to be in the playoffs, so it doesn't matter. So, um, okay, they might be. But again, this will be seen later. 
So it is baseball postseason. It'll be seen after that. We're going into Super Bowl time after that, you know, big, long football season. Do Aaron Boone. Why can't he say, or any manager or coach, leader, sports team, I was wrong by leaving Clay Holmes in the game in the ninth inning to save the game when he had blown 10 saves before that. I was wrong. That's my question, because if if he says that, is he then going to A, be held even on a higher level of responsibility? He's get now Elvin accountable. In, get Elvin in here. As a, co- as a coach, get <laughs> Elvin in here real quick. Elvin, I know you're directing. Come on in here. This is important. Elvin, our director, is uh, going to be hopping on. But it's a serious question. As people deal with this, if you admit, hey, I made a mistake, now are there going to be ramifications of it? That's my question. Uh, Elvin, how many times, and I'm not saying, oh, look at me. How many times on in our production operation and offline have I said to you, Elvin, I screwed up. I was wrong. I did not. Don't count the times, but I should not have handled it that way. A, you know that I do it a lot. B, do you think less of me when I do it? No, I think more of you when you when you call me and you say, hey, I think I dropped the ball of that. I think it's, it's good for a leader to always own their mistakes and, and say when they're wrong. OK, so. One of my favorite books in our leadership library, Extreme Ownership, own your screw-ups. I just don't get, Alvin, why coaches and managers and leaders and presidents and corporate executives and presidents of universities or heads of production companies, everybody knows you acted a certain way. Everybody knows there was a mistake. But, Mary, think about what Alvin said. But one second, Steve. When, when it goes to coaches in professional sports, it's totally different. Because why? coaches don't always make the wrong decision because they're coaching grown men. Grown men with egos, grown men who don't listen. And it's not always the coach's fault. A lot of times, these professional athletes stop playing for coaches because of the fact that they don't like the decisions that they're making. And that shouldn't happen. But Elvin... I'm not going to start screwing up our show because I don't don't agree with things that you say. You got to be a professional at the end of the day. Elvin, but the idea of extreme ownership, which is one of my favorite books, is that the leader of a team owns all of it. Elvin, you own the play on the field. You own the production operation. You own what goes on at your university. It doesn't mean that you did everything yourself, but what the heck is the point of leadership and owning it if you say it wasn't me, it was the players? You can't do that. Well, you cannot do that, no, not at all. But what I'm, what I'm trying to express to you is that sometimes people that work for you sabotage you on purpose. But as a leader, you should always take the ownership. You should. Mary, final word. I would never sabotage Steve on purpose. (laughs) Mary, go ahead. No, my my final word is I, yeah, my final word is Elvin's telling us that it's time to say goodbye. And hopefully everyone enjoyed this uh, mini seminar on the art of the Q&A. And the next time that you're engaged in a QA, and a maybe your palms will be a little less sweaty and you'll be a little bit more confident in your responses. Lessons in leadership, the best show on leadership anywhere in the world. It's, it's documented. You should check it out. (laughs) This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bicino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, the Helix, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Shoes New Jersey, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and the Meadowlands Chamber and Meadowlands Media. At Mush Foods, we choose New Jersey because it's the heart of the Northeast. And we knew that if we can succeed here, we can succeed everywhere. It's hard to have this kind of manufacturing employees and also high educated employees in the same place. And here you have it. 
Then you have also the colleges that specifically focus on food science, so you have both of them. And that's the magic. This is New Jersey. You can do anything here.